All right. Let's rewind a little bit. Folks, can you tell me a little bit? Is everyone here by show of hands? Is, is everyone here a, Q, a QA professional? Maybe you're in a role outside of QA. I'm just curious to know who's in the audience uh, today. Here, everyone's in QA. What, what other roles are here today? Ah. <laughs> Data engineering, cool. And that's it. <laughs> Okay, let's see. So in the chat, we have uh, Chris Wu. Hi, Chris. Outside of QA, but work alongside QA. Very cool. Well, I'm hoping that this talk today will be insightful for you, whether you're in QA or not. So my talk today is about building a culture of quality at Etsy, and I'll give you, you know, some background about myself. Uh, the company, how I got into QA could maybe be interesting to some of you, and then we'll define what a culture of quality actually is so that we're on the same page. We'll follow that up by talking through why a culture of quality is important, how we did it at Etsy, and more importantly, once you get there, how do you sustain it? I feel anyone should... Um, I, I will also cover the, the steps that I think people should avoid in terms of building a culture of quality, and then we'll go into some Q&A. Okay. As I said before, I work at Etsy. Our mission is to keep commerce human. And if you're familiar with Etsy, then uh, you know that we're a marketplace for unique and creative goods. Uh, we're looking at, we focus on special, extraordinary items from creators in our marketplace. Uh, over the past year, we had over 90 million buyers visit Etsy.com. Um, some of the things that I appreciate about working at Etsy is how much our leadership values sustainability, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I love, again, how we share our engineering expertise on our blog and in personal spaces, such as this one. But who am I really? Uh, well, I hold an MBA in uh, information systems, and I started at Etsy in 2013 as a QA analyst. So I spent a lot of time refining my QA analyst skills. I became a manager and then an engineering manager focused on testing and quality um, and my career progressed until now I'm a uh, director of engineering. I value speaking and coming to share ideas, exchanging ideas with people. Um, you know, that's one of my passions. And so I'm overly ecstatic to be here. A little bit about how I got into QA. Oh, I think the slide didn't advance, but I graduated from college again with a BS in computer science. And the first job that I took in 2008 was as a technical writer and a QA analyst for a small consultancy in New York City. But even during my college years, I felt strongly about aligning projects for success. You know, all of the elements about the delivery process um, that made a project successful, the communication, the user experience, the testing, the managing the timelines, the documentation. My curiosity and my attention to detail were really the elements that helped me shine. I also started to see where QA played an important role in terms of a business function. And I felt deeply that the tech industry would ultimately see things my way in terms of prioritizing quality. So with all of that said, what does a culture of quality actually mean to me? Well, I believe a culture of quality is meaningful when the priority is placed on QA. QA is broadly understood across the organization. And this means having widely communicated targets and a mutual understanding of how quality assurance investments impact the business. Harvard Business Review defines it a little bit differently, but I still appreciate this. They say that a true culture of quality is a working environment in which employees adhere to QA guidelines, but they consistently see others taking quality focused actions, they hear others talking about quality, and they feel quality all around them. In today's world, quality assurance and the efforts of software testers and quality professionals now play an important role in the success of all businesses. Particularly e-commerce companies, social media platforms, websites, as well as software and hardware companies. 
How customers experience our platforms, our websites, and our products can range from low impact issues such as small functional bugs, perhaps suboptimal performance, or even inconsistencies with the user interface. But on the flip side of that, the darker side of that, there are actually serious high risk issues that can result from poor investments in QA and testing. These include a loss of brand reputation. In some cases, people lose their lives when buggy software code isn't properly tested. Prevalent today is a loss of privacy, which can result in identity theft for millions of users. And last but not least, businesses are vulnerable to significant losses to their bottom line when major issues aren't uncovered during, during the QA process. And all of the examples that I'm sharing with you today are pulled directly from the headlines. So when a company loses $440 million in a day, that's just a bad day, a really bad day by anyone's standards. And even more so, uh, what makes it worse is that when it happens in 30 minutes, due to a software error that could have been caught by testing. This software error in particular wiped out 75% of the overall value of the biggest US equity training group in the USA and in the world at that time. Inadequate regression testing was at fault, in addition to evidence of poor QA practices when refactoring legacy code. Long story short, the company was unable to recover and they ceased operations the following year. But maybe that was too dark of an example. Here's a lighter one. Um, in September, 2014, a well-known mobile phone manufacturer had to roll back their new software update after only a few hours of its release. What went wrong? Well, users were experiencing their calls being blocked, which it sounds simple, but it's actually scary. You can't reach your family and your friends and they can't reach you. Critical features such as being able to access the device with a fingerprint check were also disabled. Needless to say, the manufacturer, manufacturer had to put a stop to the poor user experience by rolling back the update. Many of you are probably familiar, rolling back an update is costly and time consuming, and in most cases, it's unplanned for. So this was extremely inconvenient to that manufacturer. Months of hard work had to be rolled back and the bugs had to be fixed. But the overall impact was a 3.8% reduction in their stock price as investor trust deteriorated. And for my last example, I want to share about a really tragic situation where two plane crashes that killed a total of 346 people uh, across 2018 and 2019 were also discovered to be the result of poor testing. After investigations, experts reported that a critical end-to-end -end software test would have captured two key defects in the software. One analyst went as far to say that there's a clear lack of engineering culture and a long-term business culture on that business's board. To no one's surprise, the company posted a significant million dollar loss to the tune of $636 million in 2019. I don't share these examples to alarm anyone or to scare anyone. Rather, I share these examples to signal that not all businesses understand the impact QA can have on their bottom line, their brand, and their business longevity. Today, any business who transacts online, invests in testing and QA, and QA teams must also find more ways to communicate their impact in terms of business value. And now we'll move forward to how I built a culture of quality uh, at Etsy. Going on. So as you know, by now, I joined Etsy in 2013. I was a QA analyst, but I have to say that by no means was this Etsy's first investment in QA. The engineering organization was already operating in a continuous integration, continuous deploy environment. And what I observed was a company that was already empowered to test features in production and behind config flags. Engineers were, oops, sorry about that. Engineers were pushing code close to 30 or 40 times per day and each code push would have to pass a suite of continuous integration tests in order to be deployed to production. So many awesome engineers got Etsy to this place, I couldn't possibly 
name and thank them all, but it was greatly appreciated. It felt like so much of the journey to a culture of quality had already been made though, but it wasn't quite true. It wasn't quite that simple. Over the next few years, we continued to build out the manual testing team uh, to meet the needs of product teams. Back in 2014, our product teams were building new features. They were developing for our mobile apps. And in some cases, they were developing entirely new product offerings on our site. But QA still felt very resource-based. It felt very transactional. It felt like, oh, I need two QA analysts on this project, and I need three QA analysts there. And while we had these amazing CI, CD advancements, quality still felt disconnected. And ultimately, our manual testing efforts were specifically siloed to new feature development and mobile app releases. So there was a big detour, though, in 2017. We got new leadership at Etsy, and right away, they wanted to come in and create a culture of quality. At first, this objective seemed daunting to me because we didn't have a measurement in place, and this meant we couldn't track engagement. We didn't know who was testing. We didn't know how many tests they had. We didn't know why people weren't testing. We didn't know anything. We also encountered a lot of resistance from product teams. If you're in QA right now, can you raise your hand if you've ever experienced resistance? No one? Okay, well, maybe it was just me. Uh, but we encountered resistance from product teams who felt that they didn't have time to test amid their product timelines. And that was a challenge that needed to be overcome. So here's what we did do. Along with engineering leadership, we began with a stated goal to improve code quality, and we set a target of achieving 75% coverage on all new code being pushed to production. I learned then that transformation efforts, transformational efforts such as building a culture of quality requires leadership buy-in and alignment. These efforts need a stated goal at the organizational level so that everyone can understand the priority. But to be truly successful, there also needs to be consistent and visible and discussed. Uh, there, oh wait, I'm sorry. In order to truly be successful, progress toward goals needs to be consistent, visible, and discussed in broad forums. We like to center that type of conversation around measurement. The people driving these goals, the engineers, the product managers, the designers, also need to feel empowered to do what we're asking them to do. To sum it up, these bullet points represented the four core levers that would make up the strategy for the culture of quality we were building. Everything else we did ladders up into one of these uh, levers, as you will see. We started small and did only the absolutely necessary things first. So here's where we were by the end of 2017. At the end of the year, uh, in terms of measurement, we were tracking code coverage on our largest code repository. We had launched tools that empowered product teams to test their features on a variety of browsers, as well as new and old versions of each browser. But building visibility really proved key to driving momentum. We created weekly reports that tracked and communicated our progress toward our goals, and engineers engaged with the reports in a positive way. We also implemented commit hooks within our code to remind engineers when their developer environment, uh, within their developer environments as they contributed new code. In addition to the momentum we built in 2017, we also iterated and made a few strategic decisions. By the end of the, the following year, we were tracking code coverage across 13 different code repositories. We were also measuring coverage on our data science and machine learning repositories. And this was really exciting for us because it really proved that this enthusiasm for testing was spreading across the organization. In more than one case, teams were approaching us to help them get their code coverage reports started. We had hosted several lightning talk events where engineers could share their learnings about test automation and code quality. 
with anyone interested in participating. We hosted these on a quarterly basis. And then lastly, quality and testing metrics were reviewed and discussed within engineering leadership forums. And this might feel like a small thing, but to be able to talk about code coverage and bugs in production and various elements of our quality practice within the larger scope of the metrics discussed by VPs of engineering and directors of engineering really helped to keep quality top of mind. So these investments during the early years really started to snowball in terms of impact. And after two years, we had finally achieved one of the goals we set out to do. After two years, we were able to see where 75% of all new code uh, pushed with at Etsy was covered by at least 75%, uh, and that's unit test coverage. It was a great accomplishment. We had also partnered with our user research team to run an official QA sur survey across design, engineering, and product. The engineers on my team had worked to develop and launch a test account tool. So we were actually now solving pain points for testing for our customers. And the test account tool empowered not just engineers, but any person who worked at Etsy to be able to log into our site and to be able to uh, perform certain functional tests. Our efforts to paral parallelize test run jobs improved efficiencies of unit test runs by 30%. And this meant that engineers were spending less time waiting for all of those unit tests that they were writing to run before they pushed code to production. We had also launched a quality scorecard to empower product and engineering teams to have conversations about quality, to assess their own state of quality, and uh, to have thoughtful discussions about their various QA processes. In terms of stakeholder support, we had developed what we called a quality working group. And this included leadership, not just from QA, but also from product engineering, from support, you name it. We came together and we talked about what were the actual quality pain points we were, we were experiencing and which should we tackle first. As a result, uh, one of the key outcomes of this group was the addition of several uh, QA roles in specialist areas such as mobile testing, front end, and of course, data science and machine learning. But I have to say that 2020 might have been the interesting year, both for the team and I. We had enjoyed a lot of impact. Engineers were testing. Uh, our quality coaches were making progress in terms of their support in mobile front end and DSML, and things were going well. We had empowered engineers with additional tools, a cloud-based device library, and we were tackling interesting problems like providing engineers with a suitable suite of test data and partnering with a third-party service to help us run functional tests on international variations of our site. I have to say we weren't doing lightning talks anymore because they got so popular at Etsy that other teams started doing them. But what we decided to do instead is to launch Engineering Citizenship Awards. And this was an organizational effort where we mapped Etsy's guiding principles to the very same principles that we wanted engineers to value in terms of testing and this culture of quality. The awards would take place during our annual Engineering Hack Week. And the engineers who had committed uh, to a lot of tests and those who had demonstrated their ability and their championship of this new cultural culture of quality were, would be acknowledged formally and publicly. But it was also the time where my responsibilities at Etsy changed. And after three years, I would be leaving my culture of quality leadership in the capable hands of another manager. Passing the baton, as they say, I hope that you will get to hear about how they continue to shape our quality culture at Etsy in a future session of the Wise Line Learning Academy. But to be honest, being able to successfully transition out of the role and pass it on to another person is the strongest signal yet that my team and I with support from engineering leadership, engagement from engineers, we had truly built a culture of quality at Etsy that still continues to thrive today. So in a nutshell, that's how we did it. 
I didn't do it alone. It took a great team. It took support. It took engagement. Uh, but this quote is the one that comes to mind. This effort, oh, I'm sorry, creation is easy and destruction is easy, but maintenance is really hard. And it's one of my favorite quotes from Sabna Limbu. So that's why I'll briefly spend some time talking through how to sustain a culture of quality once you get there. And the first factor is blamelessness. If you're familiar with Etsy's postmortem culture and our approach to blameless learning, then it won't surprise you that we've avoided pointing fingers when we started tracking code coverage. Blamelessness is powerful because it fosters an environment of safety and trust. And once you have those two elements, you can build community. We avoided pointing, pointing fingers when things weren't going well. And as you can imagine, in the early days, asking teams to write unit tests, they weren't going very well. We reported on progress at the group level. This way, teams didn't feel isolated or called out if they didn't meet our testing expectations. Instead, we leaned in and leveraged curiosity. We asked people about what was hard. What, if anything, would make testing easier for you? And we were always surprised at what we learned. We also leaned on elements of gamif gamification, not too much, just a little bit, just enough. We like to have fun at Etsy and our engineering teams enjoy healthy competition, learning and challenging themselves. So we added elements of gamification, such as uh, top test committers, we basically just tracked the engineers who contributed the most tests during a given week, and we called them out in our newsletter. We were, uh, we were able to also call them out in our CTO's newsletter as well. That was one way that we were also able to loop in support from leadership. We used visuals and graphs to represent weekly progress by each group. We hosted lightning talks, as I said, and of course we acknowledged engineers with various types of awards. In terms of feedback and listening, we committed to listening and getting feedback, even if the feedback was rough, even if the feedback was critical. It's one of the most impactful things that we felt we could do. Our first QA survey empowered engineers to voice their concerns about this new mandate for testing. And of course they voiced their concerns. They had a lot of concerns. But our general takeaway as we read through each comment and each critique was that there was more that we could do to refine the expectations and to refine the scope. For example, we weren't looking for 100% test coverage. So that means that we could think more thoroughly about what classes, what types of files would be involved, what uh, group of files, for example, would be testable versus not testable. And that helped along um, in terms of building rapport with the engineers and building trust. We stayed, alignment, uh, stayed in alignment with leadership. We checked in with them uh, periodically and we asked for support in various ways so that we could get them involved. Um, when we launched the Engineering Citizenship Awards, for example, we did ask our CTO to present opening remarks. And that was something that he was more than willing to do to show his enthusiasm and support for testing. We kept quality visible and top of mind for people. Again, through a weekly newsletter, we got people talking about quality at the quality advisory group and in engineering leadership meetings. And then we started to expand into strategic partnerships, such as working with the onboarding team and ensuring that new engineers who came to Etsy got a preview of what it's like to test in our environment. We empowered people to drive quality and we did that continuously. We shared best practices with them for uh, product development. We con continuously assessed and evaluated third party tools so that we could provide them with options that would meet their needs. In some cases, we even built custom tooling and then, of course, we continue to empower teams to drive their own quality efforts. Developing an understanding of how QA impacts the bottom line is key. And it's important to be able to communicate that to stakeholders. During 2020, we actually started to look at how mobile app crashes impacted our ability to generate GMS. 
for many people, when their app crashes, they literally go on to do something else. They don't go back and try to relaunch the app. That means if you were trying to buy something on Etsy.com, that was it. You were going to move on. So we thought that that was a really significant data point to measure. And today, that is a measure that we consistently look at within our leadership teams. There are also other examples. For example, we know how to quantify outages uh, and production incidents to GMS. So in this way, we're constantly thinking about how to tie QA to business goals. Other ideas we explored were articulating how automated tests pay for themselves in the long term. Uh, we also talked about launches, not just in terms of QA, but in terms of the business outcomes they enabled. And this really resonated with a lot of people. All right, it feels like we're really cruising through our agenda today, but I really want to pause and just call out the things to avoid. These are things that if I knew them, I think maybe we would have gotten to where we are at Etsy a lot faster. And so I want to share them with you. So assuming that you know your uh, culture of quality should be the same as that of another company. When we first set out to build quality at Etsy, of course, we read the, the Google books and we read what they were doing at Netflix and Spotify, and it was very entertaining, uh, but ultimately they didn't fit the nuances of our stack. Not all of the elements fit into our culture. And basically what we did instead, we just took the elements that worked for us because trying to replicate the exact same thing being done at another company was too difficult. A lot of QA teams also assume that it's on the QA team alone to build a culture and that's uh, that's not true. I would avoid that. Many people assume that, you know, the QA team is responsible for all things QA, and it's really a shared responsibility. For anyone attempting to create a culture of quality, I recommend that they avoid siloing the effort to just a QA team. Sponsorship from leadership is key. So try to get an executive sponsor on board, a VP or maybe even a CTO. Input from stakeholders is required, and there needs to be avenues for individual contributors to provide their input. These are the people who will take on the culture of quality, and so there has to be opportunities for them to give feedback. My favorite misstep, attempting to do the hard stuff first. I think we all want to do everything. I remember one of the things we talked about was like, chaos testing, how can we start doing uh, chaos testing the way they do at Netflix? And it just was so far away from where we were in terms of our quality strategy at Etsy that it didn't make sense. Uh, but I feel like tackling the low hanging fruits and doing the things that came easiest for us were the, the elements that really built momentum. Those were the things that increased enthusiasm over time. And lastly, I can't restate this enough, but just partnering and you know keeping stakeholders in the loop within the, wait, I'm sorry, I got my words twisted. Stakeholders and other roles within the product delivery group need to be on board with your idea of a culture of quality. And they need to understand how they contribute to the quality effort. Overlooking their involvement will have an undesired effect and you will just end up with a lot of resistance and people saying, we don't have time for fill in the blank. Uh, but on the plus side, once you do establish these partnerships, uh, partnering with stakeholders can help to amplify the voice of QA in terms of addressing the biggest gaps and the most painful needs. In our work with our quality advisory group, they helped us explain and justify the need for additional roles within the QA team so that we could have more coverage in areas that we're screaming for attention, such as our mobile apps, as well as data science and machine learning. All right, and really we've come to the end and I just wanna just summarize the key takeaways for anyone here who maybe joined late, but ultimately I think it's a hard challenge to tackle, but I believe that anyone can do this. A company's quality standards reflects on everyone who works there. So remember that uh, having a culture of quality is important and everyone can do their part. 
I also recommend that people give their QA processes time to mature and develop. It took us about three or so years to really develop a robust culture of quality at Etsy. And it was like, there wasn't anything that we could rush. There weren't any shortcuts that we could take. We also worked to, you know, align QA with business goals. And uh, as I said, during 2020, we were also looking to develop that muscle of how do we as QA people start to speak and communicate with leadership in terms of business outcomes. We listen to our stakeholders. We make QA visible throughout the company. And more importantly, we made QA fun for the people who were driving the culture forward. We, you know, we gave them things they like to do, such as lightning talks, we gamified things, we gave them awards, and overall that fun type of enthusiasm still exists at Etsy today. We set goals and then we measured our progress toward those goals, but the key here is to also celebrate your successes. And lastly, the, I think one key takeaway is understanding that a successful culture of quality will thrive on its own, uh, it won't matter if the leader who started the culture of quality left and went to do something else, or if really talented engineers went on to pursue other roles. Uh, it's a sign of success that the culture of quality continues to thrive, and that's how it should be set up to begin with. It should not rely on just one person. So again, every company is unique, and that means that every company's culture of quality will also have to be unique so don't copy and that's the talk that's how we did it at etsy and those were a few tips on how we kept the momentum going i'd like to now open things up for any q a from either the room or from the chat Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Um, you were talking about uh, some improvements you did uh, with the measurements, especially in the in the cold uh, coverage. So, if you can uh, elaborate a little bit more, uh, what was the you know the strategy you used, or what type of coverage you used? Yes. Sure. Um, so the question was, what did we do for code coverage? So at Etsy, we primarily write code in PHP. And Etsy has been in business since about 2005. But we had never attempted to implement a coverage framework. The coverage framework for PHP is called PHP unit. And imagine all of the tech that that had, you know, built up in our code base since 2005 to about 2017 when we started trying to measure coverage. So it took us about six weeks, almost two months to even get PHP unit running. And then we had to make it resilient and we had to make it stable so that we could have confidence in the numbers that it was reporting. So that took a lot of time actually, but it was worth it. Those jobs still run today and the for itself. Great question. I don't know. Oh, Saeed, go ahead. Hi. Um, I was wondering if there was any time in those uh, three years um, where the team, where the QA team was. I, I don't uh, want to. Did he? Did he leave? Oh. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, that's a great question. So in earlier in the talk, I, I discussed where we had like a manual QA team that we were building out, but that QA felt very resource based. It felt very transactional. And uh, it, it was easy to kind of prove our value there because people wanted us to like find all of their bugs. But when our strategy shifted and we shifted our approach with it to automation, that's when we were able to have conversations with other leaders in engineering because they like talking about engineering. 
So we talked about things about, um, for example, existing tests. We talked about the fact that the tests run in, in an ongoing fashion and that they really do a lot for Etsy in terms of ensuring that we're catching bugs on our most critical pages when engineers push code. And this was valuable because, as I said before, our engineers push code about to production about 30 to 50 times per day, and they still do. So having each engineer's code pass those continuous integration tests were really meaningful. And we talked about how would we own these things? How would we maintain these things in the long term? You see, I think that question was from Jennifer. Thanks for your question. It also helped to have uh, leadership support, Jennifer. Uh, from Ricardo, how do you manage the QA operation and the strategy in this in this transition? Ooh, great question. Hmm. We really had to stop doing everything on a dime. So as I mentioned before, we had certain projects going on and we were building entirely new parts of our site. But when our new leadership team came in, we paused all of that and we actually got the time to spend time as a new team focused on our engineering strategy and taking the time to build out a vision and a plan for that. So it wasn't, um, it wasn't easy because we wanted to you know, support all of these things that were going on, but ultimately having the time to develop a plan is what helped us to be successful long-term. Okay, that was Ricardo's question. Uh, Saeed's question, oh, through, through those three years, was there a time where there was a risk of failure or a similar feeling? How did you and the team handle the situation to keep moving forward and trusting your work? Uh, very early on, Saeed, this is a great question. It feels like everything's failing. As I said, when we started um, building this culture of quality, we had almost nothing in place. We didn't know who was testing. We didn't know how many tests we had. We didn't know if those tests were good. Some of them were flaky, we found out. And it felt like people wanted to see results immediately. And I had to really step into my role as a leader and as a manager to you know, block that type of energy from the team and to also to continue to inspire the team to push ahead. So where we had hoped to be measuring uh, PHP code coverage in four weeks, it took twice as long. But once we got there, then things really started to look up. That's a great question, Saeed. Uh, from Chris, how did you determine what parts of the code base were critical for your company? Awesome question, Chris. So uh, everyone in we can't cover everything and we certainly can't cover everything 100%. Uh, it depends on each question. If we're talking about empowering people to test with tools, then we think about usage. For example, we empower teams to use a, brow a cloud browser technology, but that means we dug into our data to see for Etsy, what browsers are most important to us. And we use that to really inform uh, priorities. When it comes to our website, we looked at the the pages on our site that buyers go to the most. And we went from there. So we were able to determine that we need testing and we need unit tests on like the page where there's the add to cart button. That's very important. But maybe we don't need so many tests on the page where we tell people that a listing is no longer available. So we, we were very data driven in terms of determining priorities. Great question. Uh, how did you convince developers to create the unit testing? Ah, uh, Gerardo, you're great. I know it already. Uh, convincing them was a journey. We had to build trust. Um, we had to listen. Uh, and listening occurred. It wasn't just one sit down session where we listened. We talked constantly. I talked with managers. I talked with them. They talked about not having time. They talked about testing is too hard. And ultimately, and this came up in an earlier session today, I found that I wasn't the, the right person to have this conversation. I was the right person to lead this effort, but there was another person on the team who had a lot of influence with these groups. And for me, what I learned was that sometimes you have a message to tell people or to communicate to others, but sometimes you're not the right person to communicate that message. 
And so uh, we leverage having quality champions within these different engineering teams, but also within my team, we really found the best person to communicate some of these messages. Thank you. Harada, that was a great question. Uh, let's see, Barbara asks, how did you shift the idea that QA was the only responsible responsibility for quality? I think the once we got people starting to test, it started to show for themselves. We got people who, and actually this was a great use of our lightning talks because all of our lightning talks were pretty packed and sometimes even our CTO would attend. And people would share like, here's the time this test that I didn't wanna write, here's how it saved this code or here's how it saved this feature that I was building. And we realized that engineers were really the best people to convince other people that testing was valuable. So we gave them opportunities to do so. Uh, thank you, Barbara. I think that might've been all the questions from the chat, at least for now. Um, by the way, just as other people think of questions, uh, way to keep me on my toes. Those questions were really sharp. Thank you. Uh, are there questions in the room? Okay. Um, well, then maybe Rachel, Marielle. Maybe. Oh. Maybe one thing I'll say is I want to thank the folks at WiseLine for inviting me here to share this talk with you. Um, I did get feedback and worked with people to share like the best gems from our process. And so thank you to Rachel and Marielle. And I'll turn this over now to Marielle. Thank you, Arely. Well, thank you everyone for coming for, to this talk. Oh, another question. <laughs> So we have a, another question from Saeed. How did you decide between using a tool or building it yourself? Uh, Saeed, this is great. Uh, and I wonder if you're familiar with Etsy's history. Like there was a time where we built everything just because we had to prove that we could build it, I guess. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. But um, in terms of deciding what to build and uh, what to buy, if there were already solutions out there in the market, it was probably a better use of time to evaluate those solutions and to see which one would work. And then for specific things, th things that we really needed to dig into, like building the test account tool, I haven't seen other test account tools on the market. So we decided to build one internally and make it uh, custom for Etsy. People love that tool. They iterate on that tool all the time. It's still very much in use today. Okay, now Marielle. <laughs> more questions? Anyone else? No? All right. So everyone is saying that. thank you everyone for com for coming to the office. I think uh, it's really valuable that you give yourself time to come to the office and actually do it live because it's it's different and we want to go back to a normal life. Thank you everyone virtually and uh, we hope to see you soon in other Wiseline Academy events. And for people that are here, we hope to see you soon. To I we hope to see you tomorrow here. <laughs> We have another show that is only in the office. So thank you.